For decades, scientific dogma has dictated that the cosmic censorship hypothesis stands as a rock-solid law that cannot be violated, but I'd like to call into question the unshakable faith that this idea holds true under all circumstances. What is the cosmic censorship hypothesis? This conjecture, first proposed by the renowned physicist Sir Roger Penrose in 1969, states that singularities must be hidden from the external observer at infinity by the event horizon of a black hole. But what exactly is an event horizon? The event horizon is the region of space surrounding a singularity from which no light can escape, giving black holes their blackness. But why can't light escape? Well, light is made up of tiny wave-like particles known as photons, but these photons don't have mass. So how could a black hole pull on one, even with its immense gravitational pull? And how is something traveling at the speed of light not able to escape with ease? Contrary to what you may believe, black holes don't really suck photons into them at all. It's the space-time around them that's being pulled backward into the black hole by the immense curvature at its center. So to return to the original question, an event horizon is just a spherical shell around a black hole, at which point space-time is being pulled backward at the speed of light, making even speedy photons appear stationary. Imagine a man running on a treadmill as fast as he can at a constant speed. As you can see, he's not getting anywhere. That's because the treadmill under his feet is moving backward at the same speed he's running forward, rendering him motionless. If the speed were to increase anymore, this is precisely what's happening to photons at the edge of the event horizon. The radius of the event horizon can be calculated with the formula radius Schwarzschild equals 2 times the gravitational constant times the mass of the black hole divided by the speed of light squared. This will come in handy later. This formula means that the larger the mass of the black hole, the larger the event horizon. The mass of a black hole is not actually in the form of traditional mass. Any massive particles that enter a black hole are ripped apart by the intense tidal forces of the black hole and turned back into energy, like in Einstein's equation E equals mc squared. Mass is just another form of energy. So what form is this energy in now? Well, the energy is actually in the form of warping, or the bending of space-time in our four-dimensional bulk. Just like how an archer stores energy in a bow by drawing it back and bending the wood backward, its tension wants to make it snap back into place. This energy of warping is so great that it generates more warping in a non-linear, self-bootstrapping manner, creating a point of infinite curvature known as a singularity, the other hallmark of a black hole. And so it is argued that every singularity, with its infinite curvature and all, must be hidden beyond an event horizon created by this curvature. This implies that no light from the singularity will be able to reach a curious onlooker, seemingly confirming the cosmic censorship hypothesis. However, some very clever physicists have thought up some ingenious ways to get around this issue, a black hole loophole, if you will. In 1991, Stephen Hawking made a bet with physicists Kip Thorne and John Prisco, claiming that when any form of classical matter or field that is incapable of becoming singular in flat space-time is coupled to general relativity via the classical Einstein equations, the result can never be a naked singularity. However, Kip Thorne and John Prisco believe the formation of naked singularities to be quite possible. The award for a bet of such gravity and seriousness was to be clothing to cover the winner's nakedness. This bet was not expected to be settled for decades, or even within their lifetimes. However, just five years later, postdoctoral student Matthew Choptewick at the University of Texas brought this bet to an abrupt end. Choptewick had been working with simulating gravitational waves colliding on a supercomputer. When Choptewick precisely tuned the waves to an intermediate strength and formulated them to implode symmetrically, he was met with a seeming boiling of space-time, leaving behind only an infinitesimally small, naked singularity. That's right, a naked singularity created by simulating gravitational waves on the basis of Einstein's laws of relativity, causing Hawkins to officially concede the bet. However, this was, after all, just a simulation on a computer, and not real confirmation that a naked singularity can arise naturally in our universe, and so the search continues. 
So far, we've been discussing singularities as a single point of infinite curvature, which may be the case in a classical Schwarzschild black hole formed by the perfectly symmetrical collapse of matter into its center. But in reality, this never occurs naturally, as physicist Roy Kerr pointed out. According to Kerr, there is never a perfectly symmetrical implosion, so there will always be a dimension in which extra mass is spun around the singularity during collapse. This results in a spin. So how does this spin affect the black hole and the forming singularity? The spinning black hole warps space so much that the singularity is essentially smeared out into a loop as the black hole rotates. This is known as a ring singularity. The size of the ring is dependent on how fast the black hole is spinning. The spin of a black hole is measured on a scale from 0 to 1, known as the Kerr parameter. 0 being no spin whatsoever, and 1 being the maximum hypothetical spin. If a black hole were to achieve or surpass a spin of 1, the ring singularity would expand so much that it could peek out past the event horizon, making it visible to the outside world and violating the cosmic censorship conjecture. So what stops this from happening? Mass entering the black hole would have to be moving faster than the speed of light to add enough angular momentum to the black hole for it to surpass a spin of 1, which is likely impossible as it violates Einstein's speed limit. So what, then, will give us access to this sought-after pearl in the center of the black hole? To answer this question, I must introduce another type of black hole. Enter the Reisner Nordstrom black hole. This unique variety of black hole has both spin and charge. A Reisner Nordstrom black hole accumulates its charge by consuming a disproportionate amount of either positive or negative charges. The presence of electric charge affects the geometry of the space-time around the black hole, leading to the formation of an inner event horizon under certain conditions. Just like before, with the spinning Kerr black hole, the size of the inner event horizon increases proportionally to the charge of the black hole rather than the speed of its spin. But how would having two event horizons get us any closer to observing a singularity, you may ask? Well, that's because of a very special property of the two opposing event horizons. If they were to merge, the region near the singularity undergoes significant changes in spacetime curvature. This alteration in the geometry of spacetime may result in the singularity becoming naked and exposed to the outside world. However, there's a problem. If you want to increase the charge of a black hole, you must add charged particles, which, after all, have mass. If you recall the equation from earlier, radius Schwarzschild equals 2 times the gravitational constant times the mass of the black hole divided by the speed of light squared. Adding mass to the black hole increases the size of the outer event horizon, causing a sort of race between the horizons. To avoid this, it would be wise to add particles with the highest charge to mass ratio, a prime candidate being the electron. With a mass approximately 2,000 times less than a proton, but with equal charge. Perfect! We've got our candidate charge carrier, and we're ready to go. But in order to minimize the energy delivered to the black hole, we must slowly lower the particle as close to the event horizon as possible, redshifting its energy as it approaches the event horizon. However, at this point, we run into yet another problem. If the particle were held still while lowered down to the event horizon, since the space around the black hole is whirling, the particle would be accelerated relative to the space around it by being held from following its geodesic, causing isotropic thermal radiation and a force of buoyancy, preventing us from lowering the particle all the way down to the event horizon. This is known as Unruh radiance. As a result, the particle would sit just above the event horizon, but dropping it from this point would deliver minimal energy to the black hole therefore expanding the outer event horizon as little as possible. However, the electric field created by the charged black hole introduces a potential barrier, which stops charges near the edge of the event horizon that lack sufficient energy to overcome it. This effectively means that for this method to deliver sufficient charge to merge the event horizons and expose the singularity, a given charged particle must at once be in an energetic state while also not being in an energetic state. This paradoxical conclusion unfortunately rules out this method of producing a naked singularity. Even though this brilliant idea is foiled by two purely quantum effects, Schwinger discharge and Unruh radiance, 
it demonstrates that general relativity breaks down and no longer protects the cosmic censorship hypothesis, as there are no effects within general relativity that would prevent this method of merging horizons from occurring. From this, we can conclude that the cosmic sensor must be cognizant of quantum gravity. But the search for new ideas and exceptions is by no means over, even though all of these attempts to peer within a black hole seem to yield negative results. Each example has been able to disprove reasons we previously believed doing so to be impossible. By having brilliant, inquisitive minds explore the bewildering unknowns of the universe, we have proven countless times before that we are capable of achieving that which we have previously considered impossible, and overcoming the cosmic sensor may just be another one of those things.